right, thank you, Teddy. Yeah. Welcome. Okay, um, I'm really excited to be here. I'm glad all five of you came. <laughs> <laughs> so the good news is there's not very many of us, so you guys are going to have lots of opportunity to ask questions, which is exciting. So when it's intimate like that, you get more opportunity, I think, than when there's a huge crowd here. Um, and we'll be able to dedicate a little bit more time to your specific questions versus you know everybody else's. So um, some of you may not know me, so real quick I will tell you um, I live here in Citrus County, and um, my first novel came out in 2008. Here it is. Despite the ghost, I came out in 2008, and it's a direct. Um, pro it was actually my NaNoWriMo project of 2008. So um, you're going to find that I'm a big proponent of the NaNoWriMo, which is National Novel Writing Month, because um, almost all of my books, uh, a lot of the word count was generated then because I have kids and I have lots of excuses for why I'm not writing, but in November, those excuses go away for 30 days and my family all knows it. They have the expectation that November, I'm probably not going to cook uh, at all. <laughs> Uh, and if I do, it'll be something in the crock pot, probably. So they have the expectation that unless your limbs are coming off, you don't knock on the office door um, when I'm working. So I tend to get a lot of my words done in November. So what I'm going to tell you are things that help me start and finish um, my novels. Um, and I, and every, I had someone come in and say, well, finish. I don't know if I have trouble with start and finish. I have trouble in the middle. Um, but it says finishing, so it's starting, and then the finishing is a process, obviously, so you're going through the middle to the end. So it's starting and finishing your novel we're going to talk about today. Maybe. Hold on. Now we're going to talk about it. Okay. All right. Writers Wanted. Um, how many of you want to want to have a book and be published? Right. I was the same way. Uh, in fact, I wanted it so badly. I was an English lit major in college, um, and when I graduated, I thought, I'm going to light the world on fire with my journalistic skills. I want to be a journalist. And I proceeded to get a job at the weekly newspaper, and it paid me um, per square inch of copy. Per square inch of copy. Okay. You can imagine with all my school loans and things like that coming in, things were not, uh, bills were not being met. Um, that was not going to work for me in terms of paying the bills. So although I kept that job and actually picked up another job freelancing, freelance writing and doing press releases for um, different organizations and people and individuals, that still was not really meeting it. So I ended up picking another job. Um, and I actually got a job at Chase Manhattan Bank, um, which is, as you can imagine, I'm not a numbers gal. <laughs> and I shy away from all things financial related. but. Um, I did pick up that job because I had to get bills paid, and I somehow got sucked into the corporate America vortex for about 11 years, so a little bit over a decade. I worked for Chase Manhattan Bank. Um, my job was largely project management. Um, I trained adults. I was also a trainer, so I did corporate training. Um, I was the voice of Chase for a while, so for a very long time, when you called 1-800-AT-CHASE, you heard me with my professional to Chase Manhattan Bank voice. So um, that was me for a little while. So I did a lot of different things. Um, and all the writing that I did for about 11 years was memos and training documents and web copy and all things that are not um, novels. And I wanted to write so bad. I, I wanted to write since I was in middle school when I was so frustrated with, the at the time, the young adult novels that were in existence, which were like nothing. Um, that I just started to write my own. So um, I said, well, why not me? Why can't I be a writer? You know, it, it, there's, uh, I looked it up in this, the current statistic that was on um, UNESCO's site was there's three, over 328,000 new um, writers, and there are new books that come out every year. That's fiction and nonfiction. And that's also self-pubbed and traditionally pubbed. But that's a lot of people, 320,000. So why not you, right? Why not me? And I did start writing a novel, and I'll tell you a little bit about that in a while. But why not you? Every published author, every published book, every dream realized started just like all of us, right? Where they had nothing. And then they went from nothing to becoming published, and, and then the ball starts rolling. And it's that inertia that, that if, after you get that first one, that it does start to roll a little bit easier for you. So we're going to talk about um, eliminating all your excuses and making sure that, it, why, why can't it be you next year? You know, in 2007, I was not published. In 2008, I did National Novel Writing Month, NaNoWriMo. 2009, I had a book. I had a contract, and I had a book. Why not you? OK? Um, and we're going to talk about eliminating excuses, because your writers too lost. One of the excuses I used to use all the time is, well, 
I don't know if I know how to write a novel, or am I, you know, am I good enough to write a novel, and all that kind of thing. And I was an English major, and I would to create a writing, and that, you know, that was my thing. But you still have those doubts, um, and we're going to talk about that. But all it takes for it to be you are three things: time, which we're going to talk about in a second, how to make that time. Dedication and perseverance, which is not to be underrated, even though that's the second reason. That's that's where you're there, that's where you're spending a lot of your time on. And number three, more important, vision. And you might look at this picture and say, why did you pink, pick this big, pink Victorian as your, your vision? I'm going to tell you. Um, when I was writing my nano project uh, in 2007, I envisioned me being successful because I wanted it so bad. And I wanted to have my name on a book by the time I was 40. They'll tell you how old I was at that time. I was not yet 40. Um, I said, if I'm going to do this, I better, you know, I, I need to like really envision it happening. And this is a, from my hometown, upstate New York, Wellsville, New York. Um, this is an old Victorian in Wellsville, New York, and it's purportedly haunted, so it kind of goes along with my whole paranormal vibe. Um, and I used to envision myself on the lawn of the pink house. Um, swanning around in some lovely gown with my agent and everything else and with my first book and it was my release party so I envisioned myself having my book release party and having a vision you guys is so important I had a picture of the pink house in my office in my writing space um, for that entire time and it's actually still there but um, having a vision is so important so make sure that that you know with everything else you've got to make sure that that happens as well but to get there, as Ben Franklin um, says, by failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail. And I'm a big one, you know, I, I told you I was a project manager, so you can imagine I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a list maker. I am a list maker. I love lists. I love checking things off the list. If I think of something to put on the list that I've already done, I'll put it on the list and then check it off. So I'm that kind of gal. So preparing and making a plan, um, I'm all about that. So I'm going to help you do that today so that you can start, and the, the plan is also to get you to finish as well. So we're going to go ready, set, prep. What are you going to do now? Um, I'm going to gear this so that it's all based on the fact, or the assumption that you're going to start writing um, in, let's say, November for National Novel Writing Month. Or maybe you're writing now. If you are, Yahoo. If not, if you're nervous and you're not sure if you're there yet, then you can prepare this for November. So right now, you're going to determine what story you're going to tell. Right? What's the story of your heart? What do you want to write about? I was very purposeful when I set out to Na for NaNoWriMo. I had already written a book prior to 2007's Nan NaNoWriMo. I wrote a YA. Um, it's still in my desk. It was my very first novel. It's still in my desk. I have a little one-inch binder full of rejection slips for that book, which, you know, is, is hard, but that's okay. Um, you move on because usually your first book um, is kind of like your tester book anyway, so you kind of move on. So this was my, really my second novel that I was preparing to finish, and I was very um, on purpose with this. I actually researched, because I read every genre. I read romance, I read paranormal, I read horror, I read mystery. I read everything, really, that's out there. So I said, okay, what story am I going to tell? And I researched, and I said, okay, the number one published and purchased genre is, does anybody know? Romance. Romance. romance by far is the number one purchased genre out there. So I thought, well, Dylan, being, you know, you, you don't have, you're not very mathematically astute, however, that would tell me that if the number one published and purchased genre is romance, that's going to be the one that you're most likely to get published in. Yeah? That's what I started to do. So I said, okay, I can write a romance novel. And then I looked up the different subgenres under romance, and I saw paranormal, paranormal, and I said, okay, I'm all about that. I can do that. And that, I was very on purpose with that. Just before I go to the next point, anybody know what the number two is? Number one is romance, number two is? Inspiration. Inspiration. That's right, inspirational. Okay, now, so I determined I wanted to write romance, so guess what I had to do next? Go to my favorite library. Oh, we're in one, right? Ask my librarian and um, have them recommend top books in that genre. You need to read the genre. Next. I also went to, um, I actually went to the thrift store, but um, you, you could go to, to the regular bookstore as well. And I bought a few as reference. So I went to the bestsellers because you don't want something that's been out of date and, you know, no one's read for 10 years. You want the bestsellers. You want to know what's current now. I bought a couple as my reference books. And you need to do that. And the books you buy as reference books, you're going to mark up. I know it's like, oh, you know, any, every English major that you tell that to is like, mark a book? What? No. 
So you have to mark it up because that's going to kind of be how you learn. You're going to learn how the author um, brings in characters. You're going to learn how they establish setting. You're going to learn when the hero and heroine meet. You're going to learn how many pages are the love scenes. Things like that, right? You're going to learn what the expectations are for your genre. They're not rules, but they're reader expectations, okay? Um, and then you're, and this is going to come up all the time, and I don't know why it's coming up. It didn't come up at home. So, um, Okay, so you're then going to determine if you're going to plot it before you start writing or not. I will tell you, and I think Michelle's going to talk a little bit about plotting and hers, which is coming up right after mine. I will tell you I'm not a plotter. Uh, I'm more of a panster. Um, I, plotters are the ones that sit down and they have this beautiful, gorgeous outline. They know exactly what they're going to do in every single chapter. They know how it's going to end, and they know everything in between, and they just write it from there. And I think that's lovely. <laughs> and I can't do it. <laughs> Um, it's really difficult for me to write that way. Um, it feels very stilted. It feels very forced when I try to do it. Um, it's very tough for me. So tragically, I'm more of a panster, which is great from a creative perspective. It's murder in revisions because then you've gone off on a lot of different rabbit trails throughout your book because you didn't really know quite where you were going. You knew how it was going to end. You know how it was going to begin, or at least I do. But I'm not really quite sure how we're going to get there, the twists and turns. So. Um, you end up having to do a lot in revisions, but that's that's the way it goes for me. But um, I know Michelle's going to talk a little bit about that, so she might give you a little more information on that. Oh, um, and the other thing you're going to do is, maybe not anything, hold on. The other thing you're going to do is get to know your cast, get to know your characters. So something before you begin writing, try to understand your characters. Now I have this picture of, anybody know who this guy is? Shamar Moore. Right? He's yummy. Um, he was my inspiration for um, my last novel, which was um, Despite the Fangs. Look, he even kind of looks like him. He's got the lion tattoo and everything. He's all buff. Um, so I, I try very hard. I'm a very visual person. You'll see in a couple slides that I have a picture of my writing desk, what it actually looks like. It's, it's a travesty. It's really frightening. But um, in the back, you're always going to see a poster board um, or even just pictures. Um, tack to my bulletin board because I'm a visual person. I can't remember what the heroine's eyes are unless I constantly, oh, right, yeah, they're green, okay. You know, and that sort of thing, like it's really much better for me to visualize them if I have a picture. So go through magazines. This was my husband's men's fitness magazine. I grabbed it and he said, what are you looking for? <laughs> I said, I'm fine with heroes. So, um, <laughs> so you have an excuse to look through really fun magazines. So, um, so do that though and, and tear out pictures and Maybe tear out pictures, and uh, I had my heroine was also actually a model in that magazine as well, but I changed her eye color. I did a couple things that were a little bit different, but I had to write it on there before I put it on my poster so I wouldn't forget. Some people prefer to write it in a character. Um, I know Loretta, if you guys meet Loretta Rogers out there, she prefers to have it all written out in like a sheet. So each character has their own um, like a worksheet. Um, that doesn't work for me. I'm visual. I can't. I can't be bothered to pull up a worksheet and that sort of thing. And who knows where it is on my desk anyway. So, um, but you could write if you prefer it that way. You could write it as a worksheet. Um, I prefer the, the more visual um, aspect. Yes. Oh, I was just going to say some some people even make Pinterest boards. Yes. And I have readers of my novels make Pinterest boards of my characters. It's yep. the weirdest thing to see that. But and I do that as well. If you go to my Pinterest, I think address is at the end of this presentation, but if you go to my Pinterest page, um, man, that's the most dangerous site ever. Oh my gosh, I can lose like hours on that site. Uh, but if you go to my Pinterest board, you'll be able to see what I use as my inspiration for my hero and heroine for every single one of my novels, what I looked at for setting, what I, because I'm a very visual person, so I, I, I tend to pin a lot of stuff on that, and also my works in progress will be in there too. Okay, next you have to, before you start writing, determine your tense and your point of view. Does everybody know what I mean by tense and point of view? Tense is like, are you writing in past tense? Like I said, he said, she did, you know, it's all the past tense. Um, or you can do present tense, there's um, novels in present tense as well. Um, and your point of view, are you telling it from a first person, an eye perspective? Um, if you, and it, it's a lot of it is based on your genre. A lot of genres have expectations or, or you'll find that are typical in that genre. So YA, young adult, um, typically writes from an eye perspective. 
Are you going to go third person, he, she? Um, and limited means you stay just in that one person's, I like to call it viewfinders because I have little, I have a little kid. So, um, you know, those little viewfinders, you know, you put on. The people who are from SSRA you know I talk about this all the time. But viewfinder limits your, you can only look at what's in front of you for a viewfinder. And then you click and you go to a different screen and you click. Um, and a lot of what I see with a lot of new writers is they tend to head hop or they tend to use a lot of different viewfinders. Um, you need to just pick one and stick with it unless you're doing an omniscient perspective. But typically what I see is they're using a third person limited and then they say, um, you know, Dylan was walking down the road. Her blue eyes scanned the treetops. She knew that, you know, and that, I wouldn't, if you're writing from third person limited, I wouldn't know that they're my blue eyes. So that wouldn't really fit within that. But if you're doing omniscient, that totally would fit within that. So you kind of have to decide what you're writing in. That way you don't switch, you know, midway in between. And then the omniscient is, is, it, is it, it's from an all-seeing, all-knowing perspective. Um, and then you can switch from one viewfinder to another. So Dylan went to the mailbox to see if, you know, her agent had gotten back to her and started jumping up and down. The neighbors looked out the window and wondered, what is going on with her today? You know, so that they're looking in two different minds at once. That's more like omniscient. And there's a, a lot of books that are written um, typically in the omniscient um, point of view. So know the expectations for your genre. Figure out what you want to do. Pick a point of view and a tense and go with it. Do what feels right for your story. You can change it later. And I tell you to know what your, um, the reason despite the ghost is up there, I tell you to know what the expectations are for your genre, but don't be afraid to break them because um, my first book, which was my nano project, remember, my first book is written in first person alternate. <laughs> so I will do a chapter in Nola's perspective, who's the psychic, she's my heroine, and then I do a chapter in Parker's perspective, who's the skeptic um, that she has to try to convince that his brother is trying to, you know, get a hold of him and try to solve the mystery around his death. Um, but I switch perspectives, first person um, uh, narrative, which is unusual for the genre. And I actually had um, a couple of agents say, I really like the book, but um, I'm not really sure about the alternate first person perspective, you know, and, because it is such a different expectation for the genre. So, um, but no, no, you know, you can break the rules. Just know that you're doing it and know it may, you know, be harder for you to shop the book around. All right, what to do now? The other thing you have to do now is all about scheduling. So I'm going to give you guys, um, in a second, I'm going to give you guys a, a, something that you can use that as a tool that I use every single year for NaNoWriMo. And again, I'm really focused on NaNoWriMo because I, I believe in it. It works for me. It's gotten me four book contracts to date. So um, it works for me. I love it. Um, and I hate it at the same time. But um, I do have to schedule my writing time. I have two kids. I have a 15-year-old and a 6-year-old. Um, if given my druthers, I would rather, I'm a night writer, I'd rather write at night. I enjoy writing when everyone else is asleep. That's my time when my creative vibe is up. That's not the time I have, right? I have the time when they're gone at school. So I gotta figure out how to wake my muse up in the middle of the day, which is, which is pretty tough for me. It, it, I actually struggle with that quite a bit. So, but I have to schedule it out because the, the life happens and you have things happen. You have other things that I have to do. I'm the president of a, of a romance writers group and things like that. So I have other things that I have to get done. So scheduling your writing time is huge. Um, I would recommend that you sign up for NaNoWriMo. It is free. It's National Novel Writing Month. It starts in November 1st and it ends November 30th. And your challenge is to write 50,000 words in 30 days. I'll do the math for you. It's not my favorite thing to do, but it's 1667, 1,667 words a day, even Thanksgiving. And I do write on Thanksgiving every year. <laughs> and I host usually 12 to 15 people. So don't give me excuses. If I host 12 to 15 people and I still sit my rear end down at the computer, you guys can too. Okay. Um, and also join our writers group because um, having that positive peer pressure is huge, huge, you guys. You have to, writing is such a solitary endeavor. You have to have people that you can at least cry with or moan with or, you know, that will understand what you're going through. It's a very, very big deal. Um, and also tell your friends. I always put it on Facebook every year. Put my little, that little guy right there is a, um, a participant badge, I guess, that you can get once you sign up. Um, and you can stick it right on your Facebook profile. And um, I tell everybody, even when I'm like, oh, I don't want to tell everyone because they're going to ask me how I'm doing. But that's good because you want them to ask you how you're doing. You want the pressure. Um, it will make you right, I promise. I promise it will make you right. 
Okay, so that's that's my little nano badge, and these are my writing friends because I'm in um, a romance writers group. And that, my friend, your friend, my friends are is my desk. <laughs> and this right here is the poster board that's behind. This is my computer screen. There's the poster board. That's my words to avoid, <laughs> and my notes because um, I do write some notes and I will print out like a, just a rough like this is what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen, you know. And then you know I kind of go from there. Um, and it's chaos if you can see the rest of it. There's papers everywhere. So, um, all right, next is your calendar. So one of the handouts that I was really keen to give you today is a calendar so you guys can track how many words you're writing per day. So I'm gonna grab one and pass it back. So this is nice because um, I'm on my blog, which my blog address is on there, so is my website address. On my blog, um, I'm going to have every week a um, writer's give me five video. And that Writers Give Me Five video is going to be geared toward writers that are in nano and things that you're gonna um, that are going to come up and ways to get over different hurdles and things like that. And what I love about this calendar um, is all right, all right, so that's my that's my blog right there. Um, my website is uh, somewhere on there. I think, it's, I think it's in the hard to see part. So what I want you to do is put your name on there, and if you have a title. Put it in there if you're lucky enough to be able to do that right off the bat. I am wretched at titles. I, it usually takes me a really long time to figure out a title. So if you don't know what you're going to call it, just call it, um, you know, YA novel or, you know, romance thing. You know, whatever you want to call it. doesn't matter. You, don't fall in love with your title, by the way, because um, I did that. Well, despite the ghost, um, this was originally titled um, A Ghost of a Chance. Isn't it cute? Yeah. I love that. There's already a book with that title with my publisher. So poor Dylan did not get that title. Dylan had to come up with another one and it freaked her out for about a week. So um, don't fall in love with your title because your title is not in love with you. So um, that might not be what you want to do. So come up with a bunch of different names. That way in case your publisher has that title already, um, you're not sad like I was. So if you don't have a title, don't stress. All right, so there is no 31 days. This is an old version because I was like, wait a minute, there's no 31 days. This is supposed to be over here for Halloween. So anyway, I'm going to have a kickoff event on the 29th of October. Um, you're going to tell everybody about your goal and sign up on the 30th, Halloween. Um, if, whether you're giving candy or you're walking around with your kids and getting it, make sure you gorge because you're going to need the strength because then you start telling your words the very next day. So what you're going to do is put your daily count up here and then put your total total down here. So you've got, you're supposed to get how many per day? Everybody remember? 1667 one, six, six, per day. 1667 six, six, per day is what you hope is going to be here. And this total is going to be your running tally. So eventually you're going to have 10,000, and then 20,000, and then 30, and then 40, and then you're going to be 50,000, hopefully, when you're down here. Now, because it's my calendar, you can, you, you're welcome to put whatever birthdays and things, doctor's appointments, or whatever you've got going on that you know you're going to be out of pocket for that day. I put where I don't have school because when my two kids are home, I don't get any writing done, practically. I might get a couple sentences here and there, and I'm, I'm totally envious Stephanie Meyer who wrote the Twilight series. Everybody knows Stephanie Meyer, Twilight series. Um, she has boys, I think two or three, I can't remember how many, two or three. Um, and I read an interview with her once, and she had, you know, the boys are with her, and she was writing, and she would go in and write a sentence and then do something with the boys, and then come back in, uh, you know, five minutes later, write you know, another sentence go back out, do something else, come back in four hours later, pick right up, write maybe a paragraph, go back out. I wish I had that. Oh my I God. wish I had that. If I could ask for one gift, that would be it. That, that's amazing. It takes me a good 10 minutes to get back into the zone of where I was, so I get really cranky pants when I'm interrupted because it really it throws off my mojo major. Okay, so you're going to write your total, your daily count, every single day. I have the days where I know it's going to be really hard, so this week, Oh my word, that is going to be a really, really tough week for me. So what are your days that are going to be tough? Because you have to know that in advance so that you can plan around it. Okay? So, any questions on that at all? Pretty straightforward, right? I like tools. Like I said, I like to be able to plan. I like to know. I like to see my progress. I like to know how much more I have to do per day, per week, per month, whatever it is. Okay. So we're going to talk about strong starts, strong starts, because everyone always says, I'm not sure how to start my 
my novel. And I don't want you to get really hung up on it, because really just start wherever you want, because honestly, in revisions, you'll probably end up changing it anyway. So don't get married to the starting of your novel, because you'll probably end up changing it. So, but if you're really stuck and you just don't know how to do it, I would suggest start, well, I suggest you really should start with your main character, regardless. Um, of your novel. Don't have, uh, what I see a lot with newbie writers is they have other characters introduce their main character sort of thing. Start with your first character. And that's where those, remember those thrift store books I told you about? Where you're going to get a novel that's th pretty current, that's in the genre that you want to write and you're going to write in it. You look at those novels. Every single one of those novels on uh, that's popular now will start with their main character. Everyone. Okay? So you're going to start with your main character, and you really need to start in the middle of something. A lot of times when people give me, will give me their first whatever, 25, 100, whatever pages to read, they say, well, it doesn't really get exciting until page 100. You need it to get exciting on page one, okay, or very close to page one. So start right in the middle of things. You don't, we don't have to hear about how you grew up or you know, what happened to your main character prior to this. Um, we really need to know what's going on now. You can give us that through backstory throughout the novel, but try to start right in the middle of where things get exciting. Okay? Um, establish your main character situation immediately. If you were here for Loretta's um, during our RWA meeting, you'll, you'll already have heard this goal, motivation, conflict. Um, what is your character's goal? You should know that right off the bat. I know that for every as, as little as I plot, I still always know my GMC. I always know my characters, my heroine's goal, and my heroes. Um, what do they want? Okay. What's their motivation? Why do they want it? Why do they want that goal? And what's the conflict? What things are preventing them? Maybe things they don't even know about yet, but we'll find out on chapter 9 or 20 or whatever it is. What are the things along the way that's going to prevent them from getting there? And you have to have all three in a good novel. All right, immerse your reader immediately. You have to immediately get your reader involved because if you want to sell it to an agent or an editor, um, they're not going to read to page 120 for where it gets exciting. They're going to need to, for things for the GMC and to be immersed, they're going to need for that to happen immediately. Now, in Despite the Ghost, I did a little cheat. It, it starts with kind of a, um, an erotic daydream, a little bit of a cheat. Um, so that's kind of exciting. It gets your reader immersed immediately. Um, and basically, the, the, the heroine who's a psychic, she's, she's dreaming. She's having kind of a nice dream. And um, she's awoken by something cold touching her foot, and it turns out to be um, the ghost. Um, and then you find out a little bit about her, and, and you find out about the ghost, and immediately you're kind of into the middle of what's going on. Um, Any Which Way is a, about a grad student who's cursed. Um, you see her actually, ha the curse is happening to her right then going through um, it right in the beginning of the novel. So that kind of is how that one starts. And then um, Despite the Fangs is um, a female werewolf, an alpha werewolf, because there's too many alpha males out there. We need an alpha female, and that's what this is. I try not to write all the genres that have already been written. I, if I'm going to write a werewolf novel, it's going to be one that's not out there right now or that isn't very common. Um, and immediately she is... Um, in werewolf mode, and she's hunting down a scent, um, and she's thinking she's going to kill whatever's at the end of that scent trail. I'm not going to spoil it for you, but anyway, that's how that one starts out. So you're right in the middle of the action, okay? So we're not, there's no characters introducing anybody. You're right, right in their lives, okay? All right, hook them quick. Um, you have to have a nice hook um, at the beginning. Now, don't stress about this, because um, it may not come to you right away. Okay. The reason I have despite the things up there for is because remember I said don't get really stressed out about your first chapter. You'll probably end up redoing it in revisions. I will give a little prize to somebody who tells me how many times I revised chapter one in despite the things before it was where it needed to be. Yes. What do you guys think? It doesn't. Doesn't. Okay. What who else? Twenty. Twenty. Six. Six. Seven. Oh no. What else? Is that it? Then. Okay. Who said 14? You said 14? Who said 14? Anybody said 14? You said 12. Oh, it doesn't. Oh, you said 12. Okay. You're the closest. It was 14. Oh, wow. 14 times, you guys. I hated Thank that. You're welcome. My head was way broom. Oh, it's adorable. I know. Thank you. All right. So 14 times, you guys. Yeah. But here's the thing I did not stress about this in November. I knew it wasn't right. It was 20 pages before anybody talked. Hello? <laughs> Wrong. Can't do that, Dylan. Right? I, duh, 
I know that, right? This is my this was my third novel. I figured that much out in writing three novels. Um, I knew it wasn't right, but in NaNoWriMo, um, you just keep going. Just keep going, right? Just like Dory, just keep swimming, just, just keep writing, okay? Figure it out later, and you will figure it out later, but you, you can't spend time on it then. It's really, it's a waste of time. You need to just keep going, and it'll come to you later. So, but your first paragraph should hook your reader, and eventually I did get there. 14 revisions later, I did get there. Um, so right off the bat, in the first paragraph, you know my main character, you know what type of story you're going to have, you know my voice, and, you, and I think by the first paragraph, you know if you're going to like this or not. Okay, so um, it's, it's a very big deal, that hook, but don't stress about it because that's what revisions are for. So just get it on paper now, okay? So I'm going to tell you what you need to know for later. The hook is really important. Your first chapter, your first page, your first paragraph, your first sentence is very, very important. Don't stress about it the first time you're, you're writing, all right? I'll give you a couple of really, what I think are really good hooks. Um, and they're from different genres in case all of you don't write romance. The first one's Holly Lyle, um, who, by the way, is a fantastic um, teacher of writing craft. If you've not been to her website, it's www.hollylyle.com. It's H-O-L-L-Y-L-I-S-L-E. Um, man, tell you what, she gets some freebies on there for writing craft, and she has some that you have to pay for, too. Um, I get so much from reading her stuff, and she really keeps it real, and, um, and I love her work, too, but um, she is a New York Times bestseller. She is a fantasy writer. You guys know I read everything, so she's a fantasy writer. So listen to this hook. This is her first page. The corpse's left eye squinted at me from mere centimeters away. Decomposition lent her face an increasingly inscrutable expression. The first time I'd regained consciousness, when I found myself tied to her, she looked like she had died in terror. Okay. Are you immersed? Yeah. Do you know what this book is going to be about? You kind of have a rough idea that's going to be kind of gritty and dark, probably, right? And you know right away if you're going to like this or not, right? You're not saying, well, I fell asleep in the cemetery and somehow I ended up... No. You're looking at a corpse's eye. First sentence. It's, a, it's brilliant, right? All right. Next one is um, another New York Times bestselling author. She writes for Harlequin, Rayanne Bain. Anybody ever read her? Oh, yeah. She's good. Blackberry Summer, I love her Blackberry. I think it's a whole series, Black, a Blackberry series that she has, I don't know. I, but I read Blackberry Summer. And her book uh, starts out, lousy, stupid horoscope. Claire Bradford stood with one hand on the doorway and the other clutching her coffee go cup as she stared at the chaotic mess inside her store. I didn't even go any further because she kind of, she's sitting there, she just opened up her door, and something horrible's happened. We don't really know what it is yet, but. You're already, she, you're not, she's not driving to work when you first meet her, right? She's not talking to a friend. She's staring at something awful that happened in her store. We don't know what it is yet, but do you see how you're, you're right there, right at the beginning? Um, the last one was actually one of my critique partners from when I, was, when I lived in Tampa, Michelle Bardsley, who is now a New York Times bestselling author. I knew her when she wrote um, Erotic Romance. Um, but she writes amazing uh, paranormal romances. I love her voice. She's got a really snarky, fun, irreverent kind of voice that I adore. Um, and her, um, her novel called I'm the Vampire, That's Why, which is part of a big series, um, and it's a very good book too, um, starts out with, the night I died, I was wrestling a garbage can to the curb. I didn't even put any more because already you know you're in it, right? You know what to expect and you're in it. So, Again, don't freak out. I see a lot of people going, oh, I don't think my line's like, it's okay, right? It'll happen in revisions. Trust me, it will not happen the first time around. Or if it does, then yay for you. Then you get up here and you can teach how to do it the first time around because uh, it takes me a little while to, to craft that a little bit. Okay, now we've started. So we've talked about getting started and your hooks and everything that's at the beginning of a book, right? So now we're going to talk about how you keep that momentum going. Because right about the 15th, of this month, on your calendar, you're going to hate this, okay? You're going to hate it with every fiber of your being. I've done it, I think I'm on my sixth nano now, six or seven. Um, I hate, like, the middle of the month. I hate it because there's still so much more to go. I'm probably behind at that point, typically. Something has happened. Life has happened. One day I didn't get to write or not as much as I wanted to or something happened, right? Um, so I'm typically behind, I'm feeling the stress, you know, there's millions of people, you know, in my mind, watching me, <laughs> um, paying attention, asking me questions on Facebook or whatever. So I get really stressed out and sometimes I don't know where to go with my novel. 
Now, I'm not going to, we worked very closely together, um, Michelle and I, trying to make sure that we didn't duplicate, and she's got some really good tips for making sure that you can keep writing and keep writing fast. I did not duplicate um, her tips, but I have two that she didn't have that I thought I would share with you. And they're my two most important, actually, so I'm really excited I get to share with you these two. She has some that I, that I would also, um, that I also use, but the two that help me the most is a kitchen timer. Who has a kitchen timer? Okay. Um, when I first started um, Nano, I used my oven kitchen timer, which was in the kitchen, which was not next to my office. So when it went off, I had to get up and actually turn it off and the whole nine yards. So that's not super, super awesome, right? And it was hard because I didn't, you know, I kept checking the time and I'm like, how oh, many more minutes? You know, I had to pee and everything else. So here's what I do. I won't let myself get up until 45 minutes go by in the timer because literally, physically, I can't go more than 45 minutes without going to the bathroom because I'm always drinking, so I'm always, you know, running to the ladies' room. So 45 minutes is about as long as my rear end can be in a chair without getting up, okay? For 45 minutes, I don't get up. I close out my internet, you know, so I don't have any browsers open. There's nothing that can be distracting. I do not answer the phone unless it's the school. You know, I look at the caller ID unless it's the school and I think my kid's sick or something. I don't answer the phone. Ooh. I don't answer the phone. I do not get out of that seat for that 45 minutes, okay? Now, I'm a little bit more tech friendly, and I have it on my have a Droid, but any of you have, who have iPhones or Droid, you can download an app. My app is actually, it's a Droid, and it's called Kitchen Timer. And um, there's a rooster that crows at the end. It's the best sound ever. I'm like, yay, he's crowing, I can get up. So um, I set my, my phone, though, for, for those 45 minutes, and it's, it's always 45 minutes. So it's 45 minutes, I get up, I do something else for 15 minutes. Quick, start a load of laundry. Quick, get something ready for dinner. Quick, do this. Quick, you know, whatever I'm going to do. Then my rear end goes back in the chair for 45 more minutes. And so it goes until my kids come home, because that's the only time I have. You know, like I said, you have to schedule it out. So it's the only time I have. Okay, so kitchen timer is a writer's best friend. I don't care what kind of timer you use. I, I know people who use those little Dorothy Wizard of Oz, what is those, hourglasses, right, with the sand, yeah. Um, all right, my next thing for beating writer's block is actually um, a tip that I found on some, somebody's blog someplace. It's called Dictionary Dive. So kind of fun, right? Here's what you do. If you don't know what you're doing, in the book, and I, you literally don't even know what to write as the next sentence. And I've been there, I get there quite a bit. So I'm looking at the sentence going, I don't know. Somehow she's gotta do something and get here, but that's gonna be a little while from now, so I don't know what she's doing in here, but it has to be important because anything that you're doing has to carry your plot forward, as we all know. You can't just have miscellaneous romancing or dialogue or whatever. It has to be something that's gonna move your story forward. But I didn't know what that something was. So I was like, oh, beats me, I don't know. This, uh, I use this a lot with my last one, Despite the Fangs. I was in the middle of this, and she um, is in the cabin with Mason. Arabella, who's the werewolf, is in the cabin with Mason. Um, Mason knows that she's a werewolf, which is a bad thing, because in her pack, the law is if uh, somebody finds out what you are, because you know it's set in modern contemporary times, then he or she needs to be eliminated, because it's a threat to the pack, because nobody knows that werewolves exist. So she knows, and she's under an alias when she's with him, and so she's trying to figure out what this guy is all about, and he seems to be really unfazed by the fact that she's a werewolf, and so she, I, and I didn't know what to do with it. I knew eventually there was going to be a kiss that happened, I knew eventually there was probably going to be a romance scene that happens when they're in the cabin. That's about all I knew, really, and I didn't know a ton about Mason at the time, because I didn't do my homework, and I didn't do, know his GMC. I knew a little bit of it. You know, he needs to find his son, that's his big goal, but I didn't know the rest of his backstory. I, you know, that's, unfortunately, I don't always know my character's backstory until they reveal themselves to me when I write. So, um, I didn't know what to do. I had no idea. So I grabbed the dictionary. I said, okay, Dylan, here we go. You're gonna open up, I opened up a page, I like closed my eyes, I flipped the dictionary open, and I went like this. And I opened my eyes, and the word was commissary. So. I had to write a, a next sentence, or a next, like, two or three sentences, because sometimes it's awkward for the next sentence, but in the next two or three sentences, I had to talk about a commissary. Okay. All right. She's going to find a box underneath the bed, I think. She's in his room. She's going to find a box underneath the bed. And in the bed, there's going to be a note from a commissary. So a commissary would mean he's, who knew? 
he's military. I didn't know he was military. That's cool. He's military because there's a commissary note. Um, this commissary is where you shop when you're in the military. I was like, okay, well, what else is in the box? There's got to be three things because three is a lucky number. So, all right, what else is in the box? This is what I'm going to this, this is me at my desk. You know, it's frightening. But, okay, so then I closed my eyes and I did like this and I opened it and it was um, um, a, a glove, a surgical glove. Glove. Love. Love. I'm thinking OJ, like what am I going to do with glove in here? Okay, I know it's going to be bloody. It's going to be a bloody surgical glove and there's going to be something in like a bullet or something inside of it. Oh, I know what it could be. And it like started the whole process going. I think what the third one was, you read that for, you read that chapter. That chapter left. <laughs> that chapter never ended up staying in this book. So when you read this book and you're looking for that chapter, the chapter's not there. Um, because I didn't end up needing it. It ended up needing to be cut because Unfortunately, because I don't plot. By the time I was done with this book, it was 130,000 words, which is about 30,000 too long. So a lot had to go. That was one of the scenes that needed to go. But the point is, don't, don't get attached to your scenes. Sometimes they do have to go. Even though it was a really good scene, it didn't, it didn't go where it needed to go. So, um, but I found out a lot about my character, and it got me through that, that block. It got me through that point where I had no earthly clue what was going to happen next. And I built my whole backstory for the character of Mason based on the three items in that shoebox that never got into the novel, okay? All right, finish. you got to lose the excuses, you guys. Um, I can't tell you how many people come up to me and say, you've got to write my book. you got you got to write your book. I don't <laughs> write your book. You need to write your book. I don't know it. And they'll spend hours telling me their plot and their characters and their this and their that. And I finally have to say to them, that's awesome, but I think you should write it. Obviously, you know it. You're telling it to me. You know it. You're very close to it. You're very passionate about it. You need to write a book. And invariably, that person will say, I don't have time. I don't have time. <laughs> I feel like, do I look like I have a lot of time? I don't even match most of the days, you know? Like, really? So you have to get over yourself. Every single person on this earth has 24 hours a day, okay? And every time I start thinking that my life is way busier than everybody else's and way harder to do than anybody else's, I remember that Helen Keller also had 24 hours in a day, and you know, the president has 24 hours in a day, and you know, think of any, Stephen King has 24 hours in a day, and he has just as many, I'm sure, personal commitments and obligations and interruptions as I do, and yet he gets it done. So get over yourself. Find the time. Um, schedule the time. Be on purpose with your time. That's why I gave you a calendar in your kitchen timer, right? All right, it is a marathon, not a sprint. You've got to go for 30 days and then some. So my first, actually none of my books were done in 30 days, but my first one that was my first contract with Wild Rose Press, um, it was not done. I did my 50,000. I finished the Nano Challenge. I actually, I, I was more than 50. I was like 55 or something exciting like that. Um, but it certainly was not done yet. So I had another 30,000 to go. I think the book ended up being like 84,000 words. So I, I went till February to finish it. But it is, it is a marathon. You do have to remember that every day you're going to have to sit back down again. So I have some people say, well, I did 6,000 words this day. Well, that's good, but you got to sit down again tomorrow. You know, you still have to sit down every single day. Say no to your distractions. That does include the kids and the hubby. For this 30 days, um, I tell my children, and I'm serious, um, unless there's a limb hanging from your body or blood, um, do not knock on my door. There's a 15-year-old and a 6-year-old. You're going to be okay. Um, all your bodily needs are taken care of right now. Leave me be. Unless you're bleeding, you need to leave me be. And my husband is, it's the same way, you know, and, and he'll know because he'll come in and say, oh honey, I just wanted to, and I'll just turn around. And that's all I have to do is just turn around and be like, this couldn't wait. I, I've got 10 more minutes to write. Is someone dying? <laughs> it only takes one time for that to happen. And let me tell you, he's like, close the door. She's in the mood. So, um, but you have to be very protective of that time, okay? It's, it's your time. Um, and I'm going to tell you, the right time to write is now. Your toolbox as a writer will never be full. You will never feel like you know everything as a writer. Or if you do, um, I, I think I would challenge you that you're probably wrong. Um, I don't think you ever do know everything as a writer. I don't think you ever are at the point where you can't improve. I don't think your writer toolbox is ever full. Um, but do it anyway. Do it anyway. If you can write on a piece of paper, you have the tools you need to do it now. And lose the fear. That was big for me. Um, 
before I wrote my first novel, I was really intimidated by the fact I was a, um, I was a Girl Scout leader. I was PTA president. I was, you know, little Miss Happy Face, and then I write this book that has like three love scenes in it, and they're pretty spicy. And I was really freaked out about that for a while. I don't know why I was now. I look back now and I'm like, oh, problem. But at the time, it really flipped me out that people were going to read my book and say, <laughs> you know, and, and really be very, you know, judgmental about it. And I, it really took me a while to kind of get over that feeling. Um, and I've never experienced that, by the way, but in my mind, I was, I was really afraid of what I was writing. And you have to lose that to, in, in order to really let your creativity go. So don't stress about the rules. Um, that's a big deal. So even though I told you to learn the rules, don't stress about the rules. Um, your first draft, your nano, or if you're not doing nano, you're just doing your first draft on your own. Your first draft, and my writer friends already know, this is my, my signature line, is an act of regurgitation. It's vomiting words all over the page as long and hard and violently as you can. Get them out. Okay, it's like a really bad flu bug. You just have to, ooh, just expel it all. And that's what your first draft is. Okay, first draft, you do not let your editor in. And my editor's mean. I have a mean, mean inner editor. I can't edit when I'm doing my first draft. I cannot do it because I will not go back. It, it, it just it shuts me down. It shuts my creativity down. I cannot edit the first time around. If I know there's an error and I know I have to rewrite a section, what I do is go up to that section and put in a little, uh, like a parenthetical little phrase that says, must rewrite to include this, this, and this. And I put it in red and I leave it be and I keep going. Okay? So you have to make sure that you do that. Um, 21 days. It takes 21 days to make a habit. So you have to be, like I said, very on purpose with your time, very on purpose about writing, because it will take you 21 days. I promise you, if you do this as, to the best of your abilities, and I don't always succeed at nano, by the way. There have been years that I've only gotten to 30,000. There have been years I've gotten to 25,000. But that was 30,000 and 25,000 more than I had at the beginning of November, right? It's still okay. There isn't going to be a nano police knocking at your door saying, Dylan, you didn't win. Shame, shame on you, right? It's all about what you're doing for yourself. It's about you, okay? So it does take 21 days to make a habit, and I promise you, if you at least try to do this for the entire month of November, on December 1st, you're going to be like itchy. You're going to be like, I got to get to my computer. I got things right. I got to get to my computer. It's amazing how that happens. I rely on it every single year to happen for me because most of my words get done. Um, in November every single year. I put out about a book or a book and a half a year. You know, it takes me about nine months to write a book um, because I'm kind of slow. So I rely on that November to get a lot of my words done. Write for yourself. That is really important. Kind of like I said about the first draft is regurgitation. If you think someone's going to, if you know that someone's going to read this or you have a critique partner and you're sharing normally with your critique partner, do not share your first draft. Do not share when you're in the middle of nano. That is a very, very bad idea. Do not do it, okay? I'm telling you, you cannot share that first draft until you're done, okay? You get to a point where you're done and you feel like, okay, now I need someone to look at it because now I need some feedback or something like that, then that's fine. But you need to feel, I believe, that you can do whatever you want to do that first draft and there's nobody's eyes on it but you. You don't give it to your husband, you don't give it to your kids, you don't give it to your friends, you don't give it to anybody till you're done with that first draft. Um, all right, and then the next one is um, don't have any shame and don't hold back. Don't be like me and be, and be afraid of what you're writing and what people might think about what you're writing. Oh, I killed somebody off in the cruelest, meanest way possible. People are gonna think I'm this, this, and this. Don't, just don't do it to yourself. It's, it's not worth it. All right, that was what I had, and I, I do want to make sure, I know we started about 10 minutes late, so we, we probably have a little bit of time before Michelle takes over, so I have a little tiny bit of time for questions. Um, I did put my, my website address on there, and my email address, um, or my, that's my website, there's my blog, there's my Facebook page, there's my Pinterest page, if you want to come stalk me, that's really, <laughs> those are the avenues to take if you want to see what, what, what I do. Um, and I definitely invite you to join me. Um, I am going to go through Nano. Um, please do buddy me. Um, it should be right on the top there. My my name in NaNoWriMo is Dylan Newton, all smashed together without a space. I don't know why. Someone already had Dylan Newton. I don't know who it is. They're in trouble though. <laughs> so I had to smash mine together without a space. But um, I do want to leave you with a quote that's always on, on my computer. It's by one of the most brilliant um, writers I think that there is. 
And it's be who you are and say what you feel because those who mind don't matter. And those who matter don't mind. And that is, of course, from Dr. Smith.